I, I am so incredibly happy that Ted has decided to celebrate the, the city, and I am so deeply uh, honored that I've been allowed to be part of it. Um, I, I'd like to start with a picture of America, and I call this a picture to make it clear from the front that I have no aesthetic sensibility whatsoever. Indeed, I really did think I'm wearing business casual. Um, but in fact, this is a, a picture of America. What I've done is I've taken the 3,000-odd counties in the United States, and I've split them into tents, and I've ordered them from the most dense to the least dense counties, because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are proximity, their closeness, their density. And what the bottom line shows is the relationship between income levels and density across America. The most dense tenth of America's counties have income levels that are 50 percent higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is a common fact throughout the world that urbanization is associated with prosperity, and indeed, the three largest metropolitan areas in the United States produce 18 percent of our country's GDP, while including only 13 percent of our country's population. The top line shows a somewhat more surprising fact, for it shows the relationship between initial levels of density level and subsequent population growth over the last 10 years. And what you see is that the denser the, initial, uh, the county was initially, the faster the subsequent population growth has been. In the 19th century, we left our, our enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces uh, in the American hinterland. But in the 21st century, we're moving closer together. We're trying to be near one another. We're taking advantage of the tremendous advantages that being close to other human beings have. Now, the success of cities in the developing world dwarfs anything that's going on in the developed world. We've just recently passed this amazing halfway point where more than half of humanity now lives in cities. And it's hard not to think that that's a fundamentally good thing. Because when you compare those countries that are more than 50 percent urbanized to those countries that are less than 50 percent urbanized, you see that the more urban countries have incomes that are on average five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. Gandhi famously said that the future of India was in its uh, villages rather than in its cities. But with all due respect, the great man was deeply wrong. The future of India is very much in its cities, in places like Mumbai and Kolkata and Gargan and Bangalore, which have brought Indians together, connecting them with themselves and with the outside world, creating pathways out of poverty into, into prosperity. Now, this rosy view of cities is so different from the New York of my childhood, when it seemed like not just President Ford, but heck, history itself was telling New York to drop dead. The top image shows Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become, where it really seemed possible that all of America's older cities would revert back to some Planet of the Apes-like wilderness that would take over once urban spaces. This wasn't just an issue of New York or Chicago. In 1971, two jokers put up a sign asking the last person to leave Seattle to please turn off the lights in the city, because Boeing was cutting back on its jobs, and no one could imagine how Seattle would recover after Boeing reducing its employment. Now, in some sense, the 70s looked so bleak, because it looked as if cities had lost their entire economic reason for being. If you think about why cities formed in the U.S., they were part of solving a transportation problem. At the start of our country's history, we perched on the edge of a tremendously wealthy continent, but were fundamentally unable to access that continent's wealth. It cost as much in 1816 to ship goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the Atlantic. It was that inaccessible to get in, into America. And over the course of the 19th century, we dug canals, we built railroads, and cities formed up as nodes on this great transportation network at pinch points. Chicago, the linchpin of a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans, a city where industry came to be around transportation, where armor, invented the refrigerated rail car, which enabled Iowa-fed beef to be slaughtered in Chicago and shipped to markets in the East. But the amazing thing about cities is even when they form the most prosaic reason, like armor stockyards, miracles happen when smart people connect and are able to learn from each other. Cities have been producing chains of, of collaborative creativity since 
Plato and Socrates bickered on an Athenian street corner, and so it was in Chicago in the 1880s when a chain of brilliant architects produced the skyscraper, and so it was in Detroit in the 1890s when a cluster of entrepreneurial genius, just as collaborative, just as competitive as Silicon Valley in the 1960s and the 1970s, gave us the mass-produced car. The great tragedy of Detroit is that while their invention. Vast, vertically integrated factories producing black Model T after black Model T. While this invention was incredibly productive in the short run, it was a terrible model for urban reinvention, because factories always move to places where costs are lowest. And as those transportation costs dropped, it was no longer necessary to put the factories on the Great Lakes. It was no longer necessary to put production near the coal mines, and so industry fled. It moved to low-cost areas in the United States, and it went across the oceans. And it looked as if our cities were doomed. Now, one of the effects of declining transportation costs is that people were free to move to places that they wanted to live, and this was the rise of cities like Los Angeles, that excelled because of the lifestyle that they offered. And it appeared that the, that the thing that Americans really wanted in terms of lifestyle, above all, was warm winters. Because there's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area growth during the 20th century than January temperatures. Now, older cities were, of course, hit by the move to sun, but they were also hit by the move to sprawl, which is fundamentally reinventing our spaces around the car. Some of this reinvention was natural. The average commute by car in this country is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transit is 48 minutes. But it was also helped by massive federal investment in the highway system. The work of the economist Nathaniel Baum Snow at Brown finds that each new highway that cut into an urban core reduced the central city's population by about 18 percent relative to the rest of the metropolitan area. And of course, the federal government didn't exactly help. They followed a Potemkin village strategy that confused structures and infrastructure for the real heart of the city, which is always the people living in the city. It gave cities urban renewal, building houses in places that had no need for new houses, putting up a monorail in Detroit. This is a city that was built for 1.85 million people. It now has less than half of it. The streets are easy to drive along. It didn't need a monorail like some old Simpsons episode. <laughs> What it did need was investment in people. For in fact, the variable that explains which older, colder cities come, came back is human capital, is education, is the share of the population with a college degree as of 1940 or 1960 or 1970. This shows the relationship over the past decade across all counties between skills and, and population growth. As the share of the population with a college degree in a metropolitan area goes up by 10 percent, per capita GDP goes up on average by about $11,000. And holding your years of schooling constant, you should expect your wages to go up by about 8 percent as the share of adults with a college degree in your metropolitan area goes up by 10 percent. Now, the importance of skills in explaining urban resurgence helps make sense of a great paradox. We live in an age in which it is effortless to telecommute across the planet, in which we could all dial it in from whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia, and forego all the inconveniences that come with city life. But in so many ways, in so many places, we still choose to be around other people. We still choose cities. Now, there's a reason for this. New technologies and globalization are not enemies of the city; they are its friends. And the reason for this is that new technologies and globalization have increased the returns to being smart, and we are fundamentally a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. We come out of the womb with this remarkable ability to soak up information from our parents, from our peers, from our siblings, even occasionally from our teachers. Cities play to that advantage, and as the world has gotten more complex. The need for the face-to-face -face contact that enables us to communicate the most complicated ideas becomes even more critical. Anyone who has ever taught knows the hard part of teaching is not knowing your script; it's understanding whether or not anything that you're saying is getting through. And we have evolved in a way over millions of years to have these marvelous cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room. Cities enable the haphazard learning that occurs when young people come to, to smart places and entrepreneurial places. That's why all those Harvard graduates want to come and live in Silicon Valley, because you can't learn to be a software entrepreneur by just reading Wikipedia. You need to be there. You need to see the mistakes and failures of people around you. And indeed, as important as formal education is, certainly the most important things that cities produce are entrepreneurial talent. And measures of entrepreneurship, which are crappy, which are awful, 
do a, still a remarkable job of predicting employment growth. This is average firm size. And in 1977 and subsequent employment growth, places with big firms are typically thought to be significantly less entrepreneurial. And lo and behold, they grow at far lower rates. Small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world, these are the keys to urban success in the world today. Now, the most entrepreneurial place I've ever been in the world is the Dharavi slum in Mumbai. You go in, in one shop and there's some guys who are recycling paper boxes. That means cutting them open and turning them around so someone, someone can see the labels. And then there are, there are people sewing bras, and you feel like you're in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1904. And then there are people recycling plastic syringes and someone making these beautifully intricate pots. And you just marvel at the creativity and the energy of, of Indian entrepreneurship. And then you go outside and you see a kid defecating in an unpaved street. And you also marvel at the public failures of, of India. For indeed, Mumbai should never apologize for its poverty. Cities are full of poor people not because they make people poor, but because they attract poor people with economic opportunity, with a better social safety net, and in the US with the ability to get around without a car for every adult. But they should apologize if they're unable to deal with the downsides of density. For if two people are close enough to give each other an idea face to face, they're also close enough to exchange a contagious disease. And cities have been battling these downsides since the beginning of, of time. This is the path rate of death rates in New York City. In 1900, a boy born in New York City could expect to live seven years less than the national average. Today, life expectancies are three years longer or so in New York than the rest of the nation. No one's exactly sure why that's true among older people. Some people credit walking or better social connection. Among younger people, it's quite clear. People in cities are much less likely to die from motor vehicle accidents and suicide, both of which are leading causes of death among the young. But the health of cities did not happen by accident. It required tremendous investments. America's cities and towns were spending as much on water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. And these investments need to be made in the developing world today. Some problems, like congestion, need more than just an engineering solution. We can't just build our way out of traffic congestion. There's something called the fundamental law of vehicle, uh, vehicle traffic, which says that as vehicle miles built goes up, vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one. If you build it, they will drive. You need to do what Singapore does. Here you have the second densest country in the world. It has roads that move swiftly because it charges people for the congestion that they cause when they take to the roads. When cities are able to deal with the crime, with the congestion, with the contagious disease, they can be marvelous places of pleasure as well as productivity. The same urban innovation and entrepreneurship that makes cities productive also makes them fun, also makes for great restaurants, and the great scale of cities enables them to have great places of pleasure that have, cover the fixed costs involved in a, in a great museum or, or the Globe Theater where Shakespeare uh, plays were performed. Now, one of the challenges of successful cities is if the city is succeeding both as a place of pleasure and productivity, but it doesn't build enough housing, then it can become a boutique town affordable only to the wealthy. And this is where the great urban economist, whom I admire so much, made her one error. She looked at old buildings and new buildings and noticed that old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive. And that led her to think that the way to keep cities affordable was to make sure that no one built any new buildings on top of old buildings. That's not how supply and demand works. You need to actually build more, ha more housing if you actually expect cities to remain affordable, and her own home area of Greenwich Village, which evolved from being an affordable place to a place where hedge fund managers only need apply for townhouses, is a living proof of that. I want to end with a story about, Henry, about a, a young Harvard graduate who, in a beautiful spring day in 1844, went for a walk in the woods outside of, outside of Concord. And he went to deal, he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a chowder, the wind flicked the flames to nearby dry grass, and a fire started, and it spread. By the time it was done, it had burned up more than 300 acres of prime woodland. In his own day, this young man was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The Concord Freeman called him a flibberty gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. And indeed, they were surely right. It's hard to think of any young man in Cambridge or Boston who did as much damage to the environment as this man did. Today, of course, he is revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. He is Henry David Thoreau, whose book Walden seems to preach a gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live around nature. But of course, his own life seems to tell a different moral. His own life tells the story of how, of how destructive we are as a species. And that, in fact, Henry David Thoreau would have done a lot more good for nature if he had stayed at home in Cambridge instead of going out into the woods outside of Concord. And this is a general fact about cities. This is the, from the work that I've done with Matthew Kahn that's about um, looking at, at carbon emissions associated with living in different parts of the world. And we tend to find that people who live in cities because they drive less and because they have smaller homes, even holding income and family size constant, use much less, less energy. If the great growing economies of India and China see their carbon emissions rise to the level seen in the sprawling United States, Global carbon emissions go up by 130%. If they stop at the level seen in hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by 30%. And that's 
one final reason why America should embrace its cities and why the world should embrace its cities and why America should rethink those policies like our subsidization of, of highways, like our home mortgage interest deduction that bribes Americans to leave urban apartments and move into suburban homes, and most of all, to rethink our urban school system that does so much to discourage parents from living in, in urban areas. Thank you very much. Ed, Ed. Yeah. First of all, um, first of all, congratulations on possibly the fastest TED talk ever given. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so to, to summarize, five words. <laughs> the, the reason the world needs cities now. How, how would you rank it in, in the five key words? Cities enable us to connect and create collaboratively. Well, uh, earlier in this conference, says we had a whole thing earlier um, on climate change, sustainability. The, you know that 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 issue about um, wh whether humanity can find a way of reducing our carbon output. Cities have a role to play in that. Absolutely, right. By building up, we don't build out. And I think the evidence on carbon emissions within the U.S. and elsewhere really shows that when we live close together. We drive less, we tend to use smaller living spaces which emit less energy, and all of these things mean that cities are not the enemy of the environment, they're the friend of the environment, they're things which actually promote a more sustainable future. I, I find your book incredibly revealing and actually quite inspiring, so thank you for it, and thank you so much for coming here. Thank you so here. much for having thank Ted you. do this.